Hello and welcome to ORCSI, University of Medicine and Health Sciences. I'm Dr. Mary Collins and I'm delighted to welcome you to our event. This is the third and final event in the ORCSI My Health Positive Health mini series. Our topic for today is future proofing our youth. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Trudy Meehan. Trudy is a senior clinical psychologist specializing in child and adolescent mental health. Trudy is also a lecturer in ORCSI Center for Positive Psychology and Health. Trudy's gonna start our event with a short presentation to introduce today's topic. Thanks very much, Mary. Um, and thanks to everybody for joining us to talk about future-proofing our youth. This is my little girl. Um, it's, it's pictures a few years old now, but I started off telling her that she was beautiful. And then I remembered all the feminist writings that I'd read in college. And I remembered that we should be telling little girls that they're clever and, you know, valuing what's inside rather than what's on the outside. So I started to tell her she's smart and I was pretty happy with myself as a parent for remembering that. Then I heard about the work of this woman, Carol Dweck, and her work on mindsets. And I had a parenting crisis because Carol Dweck says that we shouldn't be telling our children they're clever or praising their intelligence that we should instead be praising the effort they put into things and the work that goes behind um, the things they do and their approach to things. And so I had a bit of a crisis and I shifted my approach to praising my little girl. And instead of telling her that she was intelligent or clever, I started to say, I really like how you approach that. Oh, wow, that's a really interesting way of thinking about that. I like how you're thinking. And I started to talk a little bit differently. And growth mindsets are really interesting when we think about future proofing our youth. And I just want to say a little bit about growth mindsets. So the cool thing about a growth mindset is that it works on the assumption that the brain is like a muscle and it uses the idea of neuroplasticity to argue that the brain can get stronger, that we can increase the connections between the neurons in our brain with exercise, with effort, when we're faced with challenge, with new experiences. And this is a really nice idea because what it means is that intelligence isn't fixed or knowable, that we can always grow our intelligence, that we can always learn new things. And this goes across throughout the lifespan, not just for young people. And the even cooler thing about that is that when we fail, it's not a reflection of how clever we are. Um, failure is just an event. And in many ways, it can be an opportunity. It can be an opportunity to exercise that muscle of our brain and try something from a different perspective or a new approach. So when we have a growth mindset, how we approach learning and challenges is more important than how smart we are, which I think is a really nice message for young people. So I've started to use that message a lot. The, it, the way I think about a growth mindset is a bit like um, honours maths and the leaving cert, um, where you're very unlikely to get the right answer, but you do get marks for effort. Um, and it's a, nice, it's a nice image and metaphor for me for life, because essentially in life, it's the effort. If you don't get to the perfect ending, that's OK, but um, it's the work that you put in along the way. And that's the argument in a growth mindset. My little girl gave me a really good example of the growth mindset. We have a lock at home and it's really sticky and it never works the first time you try and open it with the keys. And, um, and she's learned that you have to jiggle the keys around and try a few different times before the lock opens. And my partner was trying the lock and getting really frustrated and saying, we need to get a new lock. This isn't working and, and everything. And she said, no, just keep trying. Mommy said, if you just keep jiggling the keys and keep trying and don't give up, it'll work and off he went and jiggled the keys and uh, got the lock open and so for me a growth mindset and this idea of being able to jiggle things around is really important for young people because I think what we need going forward and into the future is young people who can dare to try who are brave enough to jiggle those keys to try a different approach and not give up at the first sign of a challenge and if we have young people who can dare to try, we're going to have young people who are comfortable with uncertainty, who will have tools to navigate situations of failure and who will be able to turn failure into opportunities for growth. 
and hopefully they'll be able to navigate even bounce back and at the best of times perhaps even flourish in the face of failure and it's a really nice idea and one of um, the people who really pushed this idea um, at Stanford University was Professor David Kelly and David Kelly set up the D school, which is a design school at Stanford, um, and he uses design thinking to argue for creative leadership going forward. And one of the things that David Kelly ta taught students at Stanford was this idea of fail faster, succeed sooner. And really, it's the idea that we need this trial and error learning. We need to make mistakes. We need to be able to try something out and be OK with it not being the right approach so that we can get to the next answer and the next idea. Um, and I really like that idea um, from David Kelly and the D school. And I think it's important for especially this generation of young people because they're going to face a lot of challenges that call for creative leadership. These are just some of the new dilemmas that are facing our young people at the moment. And I, I think we could put lots of things into this list. We have the global pandemic and vaccine nationalism, the global warming, food and resource shortages, changing financial systems and things like cryptocurrencies and do we know what Bitcoin is, do they know what it is, and um, growing political polarization and social injustice, which I think a lot of our young people are really clued into. Social media and the impact of social media on our mental health is something that we've had to start to grapple with and understand. And while all these things are bad, these new dilemmas also raise lots of interesting and good things. And I think one of the good things that has come about these changes is a new awareness of our interconnectedness and our interdependence. And I think that's one of the good things. And of course, these new dilemmas call for new tools for our young people to carry forward. Um, in a really interesting book, Leading from the Emerging Future, Otto Swarmer talks about how, how our time is changing. And this is a really interesting quote from that book. And he says, what's dying is an old civilization, a mindset of maximum me. What's been born, of course, is less clear. It's something that we can feel in many places on the planet Earth. It's a future that requires us to tap into a deeper level of our humanity, of who we really are and who we want to be as a society. It's a future that we can sense, feel and actualize by shifting the inner place from which we operate. It's the future that in those moments of disruption begins to presence itself through us. And I really like this quote and the idea of presence and it's a deliberate kind of misuse uh, and change of present instead of in, into presence. Because for us going forward in this, this world um, where there's a lot of unknowns, we need to be very present. We need to be able to be present for each other and for ourselves. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that um, as we go through this today. Compassion is something that I think is really important and that goes very much with the growth mindset and that our young people are going to need going forward. I've put this image of the, the kind of fierce dragon um, because the, the growth mindset has a fierceness to it. You know, you meet challenges head on and you, you kind of get through them. But the challenge for our young people going forward is that they need to be fierce, but they also need to be able to wear their heart on their sleeve and they need to be able to connect with each other with compassion. The reason I talk about compassion instead of empathy is because there's actually a difference between the two things. And studies have shown that when people experience the feeling of empathy, the pain centers of our brain light up. So we feel each other's pain. And empathy can be really challenging to feel then because we feel pain. Compassion on the other hand is really interesting because when we experience compassion, the reward centers of the brain light up. So compassion helps us feel good. And what's the difference? Compassion involves feeling another person's pain and suffering, but it also involves a desire to help. And it involves an idea or an action towards helping somebody. So the action of helping rather than just feeling pain is something that changes the emotional response. And there's a lot of research looking at the value of compassion, both for ourselves as individuals and for ourselves as a collective society. So I think our young people really need to be able to be compassionate and keep their hearts open. And a simple way to think about compassion and one of the first steps to it is, is the idea of connection. And connection in terms of human relationships is something that we know from positive psychology is really important. And there's a really nice study from the Harvard Medical School 
and they've tracked people over time. And what they found is that good relationships keep us happier and healthier and that loneliness is really dangerous and that it, it, it can be really detrimental. And when they tracked people over time, what they found was that it wasn't their middle-aged cholesterol levels that predicted how they were going to grow old. It was how satisfied they were with their relationships. So the people who were most satisfied in their relationships at age 50, those were the people who were healthiest at the age of 80. So I think this study and studies like that really show the importance of being able to establish good human connection. And it's something that we really need to help our young people be able to do. The challenge, of course, is that we have genuine and authentic human and face-to-face -face connection, but we also have a connection on social media that we need to talk about. And I'm going to talk about that going forward um, as we work through these slides. The other thing about connection and that we need to think about is this idea of mindsight that Professor Dan Siegel talks about. And Dan Siegel's work talks about how can we teach our young people to be able to imagine the mind of another person so that we can connect with them. The interesting thing in his work as well is that we also need to teach our young people and of course ourselves to be able to think about our own mind. How am I feeling right now? What am I thinking about? What state am I in? Because it's really hard to connect with somebody if you can't kind of pause and be calm and reflect on how you're feeling yourself. So the work of Dan Siegel and this book on mindset is a really accessible book um, and it can be used to work with young people to think about how we can connect better um, with each other. I want to mention Shivana Talbert here, who's a really inspirational young person that I had the opportunity to work with at Stanford University. And Shivana's beginning her PhD journey looking at um, women in the workplace and specifically black women in the workplace and looking at leadership. But in talking to Shivana, one of the things that I learned is that resilience is a complicated concept. And we can sometimes, when we expect our young people to be resilient, it's, it's almost like we're telling them to put a helmet on and just crash through everything and tolerate everything and that they have to be tough. And one of the things that her work looks at is this idea that it's unfair to expect people to just put on the crash helmet and crash through everything that we also have a responsibility to create environments and spaces that meet people with dignity and treat them with respect. So I think we have a responsibility in creating workspaces and educational spaces that meet our young people and give them dignity and respect in the spaces that they exist and not just expect them to be tough. Um, and I think that's really important. So, just a small piece on digital connection. Um, this could be a whole talk in itself, but I think it's really worth mentioning. Um, and there's two resources for people to look at on this. Um, there's the, the kind of popular media, media one, which is a, a documentary called The Social Dilemma. Um, and it's really informative and, and it's easy to access. And then Mary Aiken's work um, takes, takes us through the research and gives a much more academic overview. Um, of the impact of social media on, on our brains and um, on our well-being. And I think, you know, there's lots of good in, in virtual connections because they do foster and support genuine connection, but there's also some dangers in that. So one of the things that we can do as parents and caregivers is really to educate ourselves on social media and its impact on ourselves and young people so that we can make an informed decision and a collaborative plan. We can talk to our young people and collaborate with them. So we can ask specific questions. When do we switch off at nighttime? At what point do we take the devices away? At what point do we turn them off? At what age do we connect and have a social media account? And we can ask our young people, how much time do they want to spend on their devices every day? And oftentimes their responses might be quite reasonable. And Often, like all of us, they probably don't realize often how much time they're spending online. So it's important to have um, informed and shared conversations around these things. So essentially what I guess I'm arguing for is the idea of having snowdrops and not snowflakes in the next generation going forward. Um, I think we need young people who are daring, who are compassionate, who are connected, who are respectful, but who also feel respected by the institutions um, that they interact with. And I think a big thing, and that uh, the reason why I mentioned the image of the snowdrop is I think our young people need to find ways to be hopeful. 
and we need to support hope for them going forward. And I like the idea of the snowdrop as the flower that comes up just as winter is ending and it's the first one to pop out. Um, and there's lots of resources on hopefulness um, on our, our on the positive Center for Positive Psychology and Health website. There's a short resource on doing hope and hope hopeless times um, and looking at reasonable hope um, and how we can do kind of small acts of hope. So I think that's really important. Um, I'll come back to this at the end. and I, I don't want to uh, suggest that there's lots of problems with snowflakes because um, I've worked with millennials and I really respect them. Um, so I think we should talk about that towards the end as well. So as a parent and caregiver, you might be thinking, how do we do all this? It's all very well to talk about it. And one of the things we can do is move from looking at what's wrong with our young people to looking at their strengths. So this idea of the strength switch and Leah Waters, um, who's a really creative, positive psychologist working in the area of children, has a book called Strength Switch, which, which details this. Um, and Seligman and Sheik sent me hi, who both are really influential figures in positive psychology, talk about the role of a parent and caregiver as helping our young people find niches in which they can best live out their strengths. Leah Waters has a lovely image of what, if we created something out of clay, would we criticize it and find all the bumps and the shapes and it's out of proportion and it's a little bit ugly and you know would we pick holes in it or would we just be really happy that we created something and oftentimes we think our job is to correct our young people and find the things that are wrong so we can put them on the right path so there's an argument for looking for what they're doing right and encouraging that um, and there's some really interesting tools for that one of the ones i really like is the via character strengths assessment which you can find at viacharacter.org and they have an assessment for young people. And one of the things I love about this approach is that the things that they see as strengths are not necessarily things that we automatically think or value as strengths. So things like a sense of humor, love, um, kindness, hope, creativity, curiosity, zest. These are all things that we need in our future leaders and that are really important and our young people have in them every day. Um, and I think it's really important to be able to see it, acknowledge it, put a name on it and label it for them. The other thing we can do for young people is simply be present. It's kind of one of the easiest and one of the hardest things to do. Often the simplest things are really hard to do. And I really like this quote. Isn't this attentiveness, that feeling that someone is trying to think about us, something we want more than praise? So often we don't have to tell our young people they're doing brilliantly or that they're fantastic. Sometimes we just need to show them that we're present and that we're observing and that we're in it with them. Um, Michelle Fine, who works at the University of New York, has done some really interesting research looking at youth who are on the margins. Um, and she's found that she's looked at youth who don't engage in risky behaviors who don't end up feeling depressed and anxious and she looked at what's the difference between those youth and the youth that do and one of the big findings from her research is that trusting relationships with either a carer or an educator is really protective for youth and what her research is showing us that all we need to do sometimes is be present and be a source of trust for young people the other thing we can do is let go of being perfect and that's really hard. Um, and I love this idea from um, Julie Hames, who wrote this really lovely book, How to Raise an Adult. And she talks about the phenomenon of helicopter parenting. And she advocates letting go of perfect and learning to wince instead of pounce. And just stepping back and let, letting our young people make mistakes. And she advocates this idea of allowing freedom within limits, allowing young people to fail so that they can learn true failure. Um, and I think that's really important. And the interesting thing about Julie's work is she was actually a dean of freshmen and undergraduates at Stanford University. So she's she's worked with lots of young people and seen their challenges and kind of how being overly perfectionistic has worked against them. The other thing we can do for ourselves, because I think there's always the thing as parents and caregivers, we need to put the oxygen mask on ourselves first. And we need to let go of perfection in ourselves. And one of the most important ways to do that is with self-compassion. We need to let go of shame, shaming ourselves for being bad parents or bad caregivers. And we need to let go of self-criticism. And there's a whole area of therapy, compassion-focused therapy that's focused on the importance of this and looking at the research and value 
of, of self-compassion. The interesting thing about the work on self-compassion that, that's really pertinent for the time we're in now, and there's some really um, timely research coming out looking at the impact of self-compassion and that people who are good at it actually are dealing better with the COVID-19 situation and they're feeling less traumatized and having less COVID-19 related anxiety. So self-compassion is good for ourselves as individuals, it's good for our young people, and it's good for coping with the pandemic as well. So it's, it's but it's really hard um, and it, it, we're not good at it. Um, so I think it's something that we can do um, and something that we can learn to do, certainly. The other thing we need to go do is let go of fear, and that's really hard. We feel as parents and caregivers, we need to watch out for danger all the time and protect our young people. And of course we do. But what we know from the research is that in bad times and in challenges, there's also potential for growth um, and learning. That, that's, really, that's really important and that we need to have challenges in our lives. And the, there's, there's lots of research on the, the kind of sweet spot for adversity and stress. Too much is bad, but also too little stress um, is not good for us either. And again, some timely research coming out from, uh, for some, from, from some positive psychologists looking at the positive um, side effects, essentially, of the COVID-19 situation for young people. And young people are reporting um, that they've been getting improved sleep. They're relieved with the lack of social pressure and they're experiencing kind of an enjoyment with more time, more free time to think. Uh, the other things that's been reported is a greater appreciation of nature and family, having time to engage in new hobbies that they wouldn't otherwise have had time, and a greater sense of meaning and connectedness in life as well. So I think, although there's a lot to fear at the moment, there is also kind of unforeseen positive side effects, and, and that happens often um, with challenging situations. So I think as, as parents and caregivers, we need to give ourselves permission to not be so fearful and and expect that there will be some positives that comes out of these challenging times as well lastly i just want to point to some resources um, for all of you and um, to go back to and i think really for those of you who are parenting not four-year-olds i would suggest just survive it and uh, sleep just be present for them and be connected when you can um, for people with four to 11 year olds, some of these books, um, Carol Dweck's work on mindset, Dan Siegel on mindsight, and Leo Water's stuff on the strength switch are good books to read and start to think about how you want to talk to your young people. What kind of narrative and what kind of ways of talking about themselves do you want to start to internalize for them? Dan Siegel has a really great book for teenagers that you should read along with your teenager. And it's about the wonders of the teenage brain. Um, and, you know, because the story is teenagers are awful and the teenage brain is awful and there's all these hormones. But he flips that and talks about the wonders of the teenage brain and the things that we really need to appreciate um, for both our young people and ourselves. So it's a great one to look at if you have teenagers. I think um, it's really important to watch things with them as well. So if you're looking for documentaries, Kiss the Ground is, is one or something like that. And the reason I've highlighted that one is because of the idea we need to show that there's hope. There's so many challenges facing this generation. They also need to know that there's people working on it. So Kiss the Ground talks about regeneration of our soil and environmental activism. And there's a lot of really clever people working on these issues. And there's hope. And I think our young people really need to have a sense that there's hope for the future. Um, the Last Dance is a really good one to look at if you're interested in growth mindsets. Carol Dweck talks about Michael Jordan, who The Last Dance is about, as being a really good example of, of an athlete with a growth mindset. So it's a nice one to look at with young people, especially anybody who's interested in sport. And then for all ages, and even just for ourselves, I think the social dilemma and looking at Mary Aiken's work on, on, on social, um, social media is really important just so that we can keep informed. That's just some resources to leave you with. And um, thanks for joining in this conversation. And it was great speaking to you all. Thanks so much, Trudy, for sharing um, such helpful insights on future-proofing our youth. I think you've given us um, lots of excellent resources to follow up on as well. Um, 
Trudy, I just want to come back to the image you shared uh, about the snowdrop. I really liked that and, and the snowflake. And I know we often refer to particularly the millennial generation. Um, so roughly born 1980 to 95, that generation is the snowflake generation, which is quite a ne has quite a negative connotation, as you mentioned. And we know from the research that millennials um, are the most socially conscious generation. So we've seen, you know, fantastic um, global efforts around climate change. I think diversity and inclusion as well um, is, is a big one. That makes a lot of sense to me. And certainly for me, with the young people I've been working with as a lecturer, it's been really inspiring to work with young people who are at the front of social justice issues. And, and the thing that inspires me most about them is that they're able to engage a complex issue like social justice mm. with a lot of compassion and empathy. And that's really hard to do. Um, and it's it's one of the things actually back to Shivana Talbert, the student from Stanford that I mentioned, mm. she talked about the difference between calling people out and calling people in mm. when you're having conversations around social justice issues. And I, I think that's, that's what that generation is doing very well, um, including people and calling people in with compassion. Yes, yes. I really like that calling people in. And Trudy, if we, if we just stay with the, the generational piece for a moment, the, the, the youngest generation in our workplace now and teenagers um, are Generation Z or the centennials. And I think it's quite interesting what's coming through um, some of the research around their emotional intelligence and the areas that they are scoring significantly lower on which are around independence, problem solving, and stress tolerance. So it would be great to hear from you, Trudy, particularly around that independence. How can we foster independence in our teenagers? Yeah, thanks, Mary. It's, it's a really great question. And it's, it's a really scary prospect because independence um, implies danger, essentially, as a, as a parent and caregiver, you know, you're sending them out to be free. Um, and I think it calls on us as parents and caregivers to find a way to sit with that fear um, and understand that it's important developmentally that they have space to learn and grow it, that it's essential, that the, there's no other choice. They have to have that to some extent. But we can do things to, to buffer that um, and to kind of set them up for success when they're out there with independence. Um, and it starts early. Um, Things like free play and encouraging our young people when they're smaller and younger to have independence in how they approach play, to give them choices in the play they decide to do rather than overly structuring everything and um, to leave them to it, essentially. So to give them space to kind of wander about their bedroom. What am I going to play with? Let them be bored, a little bit confused and um, not really know what to do. And um, to, to almost let them go back to their space. So they will come to us, they will ask for direction, but often they, they just need to know that we're there. They don't need us to intervene. So um, I think what's happened for a lot of us when our children turn to us, we over intervene and we start directing and structuring. And I think all we need to do is acknowledge, yes, I'm, I'm still here, I'm, I'm, I'm here, but off you go and send them back. Um, and that establishes confidence early on. Um, the interesting thing, I think, with teenagers and the big thing that people worry about is how to get them to kind of think about things better and not engage in risky behaviours. And uh, Dan Siegel has a really nice approach to this, which I really like. Um, and he talks about it in terms of mind sight. And his approach is that... Um, instead of giving young people kind of the statistics and this is really dangerous and are you sure you want to engage in this risky behavior? One of the ways to engage them is to get them to connect emotionally with the impact of their behavior. So you can ask them, you know, if you're talking about a teenager about driving too fast, for example, you can say to them, how would you feel if when you were driving too fast, you crashed and hurt somebody else? And if you can get them to reflect on the impact of their behavior on somebody else and get them to engage empathy and compassion and imagining somebody else's world, that's more likely to impact on their risk-taking behavior 
rather than kind of giving them the scare tactics and you know giving them the stats and i like that approach because it's hopeful in that it might reduce risky behavior but you're also getting them to think about other people's worlds and minds so it's helpful as well and i know you like me trudy and probably like many people uh, joining us are headmistress of your home at the moment um and it it is it's very very difficult and you mentioned about letting go of perfectionism um particularly for parents and the importance of showing of 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 having self-compassion at this time can you share with us trudy a few practical ways that we can work on that self-compassion there's some some very structured things we can do so there's meditations that are available online and um, the one that's most known is a loving kindness meditation so anybody can google that and there's a it's a guided meditation that talks you through building compassion for yourself and sending that compassion out to other people and that's a practice that you can do it's challenging it's hard for us as people who are both head mistress and working to find the time to do that so the things we can do as well is small things um just reflecting and remembering on times when you yourself were kind to other people and then just applying that same kindness back to yourself so just thinking of moments just thinking you know if this was somebody else would I be this mean to myself um, and that and to almost work that into your day um, and we can do that by catching our self-talk our self-talk can often be very negative um, and it takes time and the biggest thing is reflection so one of the things that i find helpful um, and that people ask people to do a lot of the time sit in the car or when you sit at your laptop something you do repetitively every day when you sit wherever that is breathe just for a second and just reflect on what's going on inside your head just kind of review your self-talk and if it's very harsh just kind of have a little word with yourself and, 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 and say, would you talk to your child like this? Would you talk to your colleague? Would you talk to your partner? And it's a small thing, um, but I think it's those small things that are really important in terms of being compassionate for ourselves. Um, the last thing I'd say is that I think a lot of us find it hard to be honest with each other about the failings. Everybody's trying to kind of put a best, a, the best face forward, but everybody's struggling. Um, and I think the more honest we can be with each other in terms of friends, family and colleagues and just saying, look, I'm not managing to do everything um, and I'm not getting all the homeschooling done. I'm not meeting all my deadlines. I'm surviving. Um, and I think that's great that I'm surviving. And I think we need a little bit of honesty amongst ourselves because it can become kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy that we're raising the bar too high all the time. Um, and, and I think if one person kind of takes that risk, to be honest, there'll be a sigh of relief in the virtual zoom meeting or whatever meeting you're having where everyone's going I'm, I'm not doing this well either yeah Trudy I think it's fair to say that our our young people have been through unprecedented challenge and adversity over the last year or so in particular and I know there's a lot of research around post-traumatic growth and how stress and adversity can actually, we can, we can look at it through a more positive lens. Would you share your thoughts with us on that, please? It, it's really important research um, and it's important to, to highlight it. So thanks for giving me the chance. And one of the things that's coming out is that stress is helpful. Um, and we know that if we're a little bit stressed, we get some cortisol released in the brain and that actually helps us build neurons in our hippocampus and our hippocampus is to, it builds memory and new learning and it's important. So in order to be good at learning, we need a tiny bit of stress. It's important. Now, chronic stress is a different thing and that stress is going on for a long time and nobody wants that and it's not good for us. But small bits of stress are really important. So I think one of the things, and, and that's important in the idea of post-traumatic growth, that there are moments of stress where there are also moments of growth and learning opportunities. And um, Aliyah Crum's work at Stanford University um, is looking at the idea that stress can help us grow and, and develop and that how we think about stress is really important. 
rather than just the kind of objective outside stressor that's impacting on us, we can change that impact by changing how we think about it. So how we story the COVID-19 pandemic is really important. Is it, is it this disaster? Is it really scary? Or is it an opportunity for our young people? So we can change how we talk about this current stress. And um, the, the really nice story from Aaliyah Crumb's research that I like is um, she gave some undergraduates the task of doing public speaking. And um, when she got them to be excited about it, um, the, their cortisol levels didn't spike in a bad way. They had, they had good levels. Um, and what came from this research is that you can shift your body's response to stress from being terrified and totally overstressed to being excited and having a good feeling. So one of the things we can do with our young people and ourselves when we're faced with stress is, is to have this little mantra. When you feel that, that, that pain of stress in your tummy or wherever you feel it, to acknowledge it and say, I'm a little bit scared, but mostly I'm excited. And that shifts that fear and stress response into something around excitement and something new. And we can start to see stress as interesting rather than as dangerous. And that's really helpful. Um, and it's something that we can take control of when we can't control the stresses themselves, if that makes sense. Yes, that's a really helpful, Trudy. And I think the, the power of language and the importance of just reframing um, the stress in a more positive way. Great. So, so as we come to the end of our discussion, um, Trudy, what would be your key take home messages for people watching uh, around how we can future proof our youth? It's really simple and um, play, allow them to play and play yourself as an adult, because we have to roll, we have to be the role models for our young people and we have to show them that we can relax, that we can make mistakes and in play, we're always imperfect. We're acting the, you know, the clown. Um, so make space for play, both in our own lives and allow our young people to play and be a little bit steady because it's really important for their development. Great. Thank you so much, Trudy. Thanks so much to Trudy for sharing her rich insights with us today. If you missed the first two events in this mini series, the first one was the science of happiness and the second one was managing coronaphobia, staying present. Both of those events are available to watch on YouTube. If you have enjoyed the topics we've covered as part of the RCSI My Health Positive Health mini series, we would invite you to register for our 10 part upcoming program on the science of health and happiness. That online program is starting on March 3rd and you can register on the RCSI Centre for Positive Psychology and Health page. Thanks for joining us today. Goodbye from us all in RCSI. Stay safe and take care.